I was holding a revival meeting in Asheville, North Carolina, and one of the professors there, when he was invited to come to the services, as he was cutting the lawn and mowing his lawn, he was invited by one of the deacons to come to the service that night. This deacon said, well, I tell you, I'll not be found at that tent meeting. He said, J. Harold Smith is nothing more than just a religious racketeer. He has majored in hypnosis, and he knows exactly how to hypnotize you. He knows how to get you to where when he starts to take the offering, that left hand will just go right back and get a hold of your purse and pull it out and empty it up in one of the tubs in which he takes the offering. I don't know a thing about hypnosis. And if I did, I would not use it in a religious service. This deacon, after this professor had cursed and sworn, said, I'm sorry, Pop. I didn't know you felt that way about it. I'd have never mentioned the revival meeting to you. He backed his automobile out and started with the revival meeting. This professor started his motor according to a testimony of a lady across the street and he had gone just about 20 feet mowing his lawn when he grabbed himself and screamed and fell over on the ground dead. 29 years old in perfect health. And in a minute after he was cursing God, he was dead and in hell. I was holding a revival meeting in Louisiana in one of the big rodeos. We came to the last night of the revival meeting and I was preaching the sermon that I'm preaching tonight. And I gave an invitation all during the meeting, all during that service. On my right, in the extreme corner of that rodeo were three businessmen of that city. They laughed. They made fun. They lit their cigarettes. They cursed. They cursed me. They cursed the ushers. They cursed the sponsors of that revival meeting. And when about 400 people got up out of their seats and began to walk down to give their hearts to Christ, they began to make all sorts of catty remarks and filthy remarks about those who were coming to the altar. I met them as they came down out of the rodeo and I said, I do not know who you gentlemen are, but all three of you have blasphemed against God's spirit and you've stepped over God's deadline. One of them said, is that right? I didn't say another word. They left. The next morning at 8 o'clock, one of those businessmen put his key in his door to unlock his business and dropped dead in the street before he could open the door. At 11.30 that day, the second businessman started to cross the street in that little city and dropped dead in the middle of the street with a heart attack. At 5.30 that afternoon, the third one was sitting in his office with his secretary and he said to her, before the sun goes down, I'll be in hell. And she said, ask God to forgive you. But he said it's too late and pitched out of his chair a corpse. But it's okay for him, God to just kill them outright? What? Where's the logic in that? Yeah, this doesn't prove that God exists at all because there's no way that you could prove that the deaths were caused by a supernatural force. A man once said, Whenever I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. I find it awfully coincidental that this only happens in Christianity. Now, how did the preacher know that if he told all three men in front of everybody in the service, God's going to kill all three of you? Isn't that a bold statement to make? Because, because if it didn't happen... He'd be seen as a con artist. And yet he says, he points his finger. He says, God's going to kill all three of you. And the next day, all three men died. And the really frightening, disturbing, the last one, he knew he was about to die. He knew it. He said to a secretary who later related the story <coughs> to J. Harold Smith, you see that sun out there? Before that sun sets, I will be I'm dead and in hell. My two buddies on hell. I will join them. News, news yet of the, uh, the death of his 
two friends had not reached them yet. How did he know these two friends were dead? The night before, he was hostile to Christianity. He did not believe in any of it. But all of a sudden, he's telling his secretary, I will be in hell. Some supernatural going on. Is it God? Because these, I kind of, look, anything that happens can be explained scientifically. It's just up to your pee pains to figure out what the fuck is going on, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm going through a season of doubt. Is Jesus really real? And they've proven there was no Moses, no Exodus out of Egypt, no Adam and Eve. So I'm, I'm seriously wanting to know, did God really kill him or something scientific going on? And don't be like that queer as a football bat, Jimmy Snow. All those stories never happen. That's the easy way out. They happen. They are told by reputable sources. J. Harold Smith was a famed Southern Baptist evangelist in good standing with the community. He believed in that verse in Revelation, and all lies shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So why in the hell would he tell lies in this sermon? Because he knows better than to do that shit. It can be assumed that as a result of a huge number of interactions between neural elements, fields of interaction are created. And these fields of interactions, which we call neural fields, might not be limited by the brain structure, but they affect the structure of space and serve as means of transmission from brain to brain. It means that each one of us is interacting all the time without us knowing, without necessarily being aware. From this, interactions exist among us, which I call the hyperfield. What if the reality you know is nothing more than an illusion? What if someone told you... You say, preacher, have you ever known anybody to commit this sin? I have never known but 21 men to commit this sin. I have never known a woman out of all of the millions that I've ever preached to for these 41 years. I have never known a woman to commit this sin. That is personally. But I have known and I do know 21 men personally that committed this sin. You say, Brother Smith, how long does one live after they commit this sin? I have never known a man after he commits this sin to live out a 24-hour one-day period. All of them to die before that day is out. I recently did this video where I coached, where I suckered Sin and Q in the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I was hoping Shannon Q would die within three days of having blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Because then I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is real, that I'm going to live forever in heaven, that I'm not going to have to go out of existence when I die. I curse you! You are being cursed! I curse you, Holy Ghost! I curse you. You are cursed, Holy Ghost. Shannon is cursing you, Holy Ghost. You are cursed. What if I'm not dead within 24 hours? <laughs> if only I was a killing guy. But again, you're too cheap. I was in Walhalla, South Carolina. On this particular night, I'd preached and we had given the invitation and about 80% of all the congregation had come forward. But sitting to my right in this section right here was a man and a woman and a little girl between them. I was so impressed to speak to them until I could not get down the aisle for the crowd. So I just pushed my way through, stepped on the, this pew, the second pew, and the third pew and stopped right in front of them. And I said to the gentleman, are you saved? He said, yes, I am. I said to the lady, are you saved? She said, yes, I am. Then I turned to the little girl and I said, are you saved, honey? She said, no, sir, I'm not. I said, how old are you? She said, I'm 14. I said, what is your name? She said, my name is Katie. I said, Katie, I believe that the Holy Spirit sent me back here to speak to you. We cannot get out into the altar because the aisles are so filled where the people are there. But would you just bow your little head and let me pray with you right here. Would you do it, honey? 
She stood there for a moment and said, not tonight. I'll never forget her dad and her mother began to cry and they said, Katie, let Preacher Smith pray for you. Mama, I don't want him to pray for me. Katie, let Preacher Smith pray for you. Daddy, I don't want him to pray for me. And then I said, Katie, if somehow or another you could know that before this day is over and before this night is over, you'd be in hell. Would you let your dad or your mother or me pray for you? I'll never forget it. She folded her little arms across her chest. And she said, if I knew I'd be in hell before midnight, I wouldn't let you or anybody else pray for me. I turned and went back and dismissed that service. On the way home, this father stopped at a service station and filled up his tank, a car tank with high octane gasoline. They lived four miles out of Walhalla on the left side of the main highway. The father was given the cue and the signal at a turn, but four drunken men were coming up that highway in excess speed, the, the, the patrol said, of over 90 miles an hour. The father said, I saw the lights of the approaching automobile, but I didn't know it was coming that fast. And before he could turn left, that car struck them and whirled them over three or four times. I've forgotten. The father was hardly injured at all. The mother was hardly injured at all. But little Katie was wedged in that back seat. And the car, when he stopped rolling, was upside down. The gasoline tank had been ruptured, and that gasoline was pouring out and running down that highway. The man that was telling me about it, he said, Preacher, I was the second automobile to arrive on that scene. He said, I suppose in 20 minutes there must have been 50 people around that accident. And another gentleman and I were up in the back seat trying to free the legs of this little girl from that seat so we could get her out of that automobile. One of these drunken men got out of his car they went on about as far as the back of the church here, and he wrecked their car, got out, walked back up there, lit a cigarette, and threw that match down in that gasoline. Didn't realize there was gasoline. This gentleman was telling me, he said, Preacher, I saw that flash. I looked back over my shoulder, and I saw that flame coming up that highway. He said, I made a super effort to try to free the legs of that little girl, and I failed. And he said, just before the fire got there, I jumped out of the car. And the other gentleman had to get out and he said, what I heard and saw the next 30 seconds, I hope I will never experience again. He said, that little girl began to scream. Daddy, mother, somebody get me out of this car, daddy. I'm going to burn to death. Mama, mama, I'm going to go to hell, mama. I'm going to go to hell, mama. Somebody get me out of this automobile. He said, preacher, I remember one of the things she said was, mama. I wish I'd have let Preacher Smith pray for me. He said, by the hell, we had to restrain that father and mother to keep them from running into that fire. And he said, that mother got up as close as the heat would allow her and said, Katie, can you hear me? Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama, I can hear you. Katie, you are going to burn to death. We cannot get you out. Pray, Katie. Mama. Mama. I can't pray. And he said, Preacher, when that fire got in there, if you've ever seen a chicken, when you'd wring its neck and you see it flopping around on the ground, floundering on the ground, he said, that's the way that little girl began to flounder and scream as she died without Christ, just 14 years old. I just wonder this morning if there's some teens that are lost You've been baptized, you joined the church, you're faithful in your attendance. You have a wonderful record in training union and all the other activities of the church. But away down deep in your heart, you know you're lost, that you do not have Christ. Will you say no to him today and step over this deadline? Will you do it? Preacher, sure I could stand here for the next hour and relate one after another the next two hours the next two days and perhaps the whole month just relating one incident after another that's taken place in my life the young man that i beg i for one am going through a serious crisis of faith do you think you'll get me to change my mind while these stories remain undebunked and not scientifically explained Sucker! You never fucking do it. I don't like these stories, but you know. With my doubts, because they've.
proven there was no Exodus, no Moses, no no Adam and Eve, but I still believe in Jesus. I just got to. If I don't believe in Jesus, if I, if I find myself not believing in Jesus, I'm in the uttermost anxiety and terror. You wouldn't believe. They say if you take one step towards God, he'll take a giant leap towards you. What about all the atheists that beg for faith? And God never answered them. All these stories, oh, I prayed to God, I asked God, are you real? And something miraculous happened. God spoke to me. What about the people he didn't speak to? I need to get to the bottom of what's going on. If Jesus is Lord, I will fall down on my face and praise him. If he's not, we need to dethrone him. So, Aaron Ra, Aaron Ra, if he could just provide me one illustration where a person mocked the Islamic God or Hindu gods or refused to convert to their religion that were killed, not by other Hindus or Islamics, but by quote unquote acts of God. If you get give me a few uh, cases of this, that would help. You need it. Uh, is Jesus real? I'm obsessed to know. I got. I gotta know. I got. Is Jesus real? Trust me. I'm asking him, but I'm still waiting for the answer. I'm angry at God. I will say this. I invoke the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I swear by the Word of God, which God's honest above His own name. That if Jesus did not save me and also let me be a good looking guy, a hottie, and have the long forms, longer than the Canadian model, supermodel Monica Snorri, longer than Becker's, the bartender played by Terry Farrer, if I do not have long forms and these two women, if I do not become a good looking guy, if Jesus did not let me have this while looking in my 20s, then the Holy Ghost is of the devil and go and go and can and can go to hell. I vote the name of Jesus Christ for this. Night, Night mom. You. you do. Quite frankly, if I cannot be a good looking guy, I don't want to live. So let God kill me. Me, but instead you stood up, you spit me out, you kicked me down. I hate your death, but love me. Oh. They said to kill my soul, they ripped my heart from my chest. Yeah.